they've been a great partner uh, helping us uh, with this web uh, webinar and uh, with referee development in general. Uh, so we thank uh, the Ringo Premiership uh, for their help tonight. I uh, just want to thank a couple of people before we get going. Um, Kara uh, and Kevin, who have done a great job uh, organizing this um, and uh, putting this together. Uh, I also want to thank Tom Felice and uh, Alex Gillies, who are uh, helping out in the background here as well uh, with some of the stuff you'll see tonight. And uh, most importantly, our featured uh, clinician tonight, Sandra Serafini. We are exceptionally lucky to have her uh, pinch hit for us today, actually, uh, for Rachel. We much appreciate her uh, saving us and stepping in. Uh, we had hoped to have her later in the uh, series, but we uh, moved her up to tonight, and uh, she's been awesome at, uh, at helping us out here. So much appreciated. Uh, one of my favorite people here in the soccer world, uh, Feeney, thank you very much. So it's all yours. All right, I think we have liftoff. Excellent. Well, thanks very much, Kevin, and I, I really want to echo um, what what Paul said. Uh, thank you very much to the sponsors for making this series possible, and uh, to Kevin, Kara, Alex, Tom, and Paul, and, and Levon, thank you so much for, for having me. Um, and most of all, thank you to all of you who have taken time out of your, your day. I uh, hope everyone is safe and sanitized, and I um, uh, really appreciate you taking time to come on to the to the series here. I think there's a hunger out there while games are not going on and we've watched 18 versions of the 1970 uh, or 1984 World Cup and things. So I really appreciate that everyone is still hungry to learn and is uh, taking the time and the effort to come on to the, the series there. So hopefully we take away a couple of points um, and have some have some fun in there. And um, yeah, and thanks for thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And what we're going to talk about today is uh, some positioning. Uh, so this might be a little bit of a departure from the usual things that, that we look at in a series. And uh, what I like about going over positioning is that the best practices that we have in positioning can really apply to any level of the game. It applies to the youth level. It applies to uh, the adult amateur level, it applies to the professional level, the international level. So this is really uh, the concepts we're going to talk about tonight um, will really be applicable and you'll be able to put into practice uh, regardless of the level that you officiate at and it will stay with you as you advance, you know, through through the various levels or or go back and forth. So the only thing that really changes between the youth to adult to professional level is, is the speed of the game um, when, it, when it comes to positioning. So it's really being able to look at those visual cues that we're gonna talk about tonight and recognizing them quickly so that you can uh, put yourself in the best position to, if not make the best call, at least let everyone believe you when, when you make your call. Um, so that's, that's uh, just as helpful sometimes, if not more helpful to have everyone believe you uh, when you're making your decisions. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention before we get started is, uh, as is the case with a lot of these webinars and instructional sessions, we use video from professional and sometimes the international game. And if you're wondering how that applies to you, um, it still does apply. What we're looking for is not to pattern match with what we see, but to really take the concepts that we're talking about and all the professional video lets us do is give us good quality video with good replays, good angles, and, and some high definition there. So please don't be intimidated by the use of uh, a video that shows uh, professional or international players and uh, really hone in on the concepts that we're talking about so that you can bring it to your own game. Um, don't worry about what the referee does. Um, you know, they're doing a heck of a job. Uh, we are going to point out some areas that are positive in the clips that we're going to look at uh, so we can model some of our best practices. And we're also going to look at uh, some areas where we can look for points for improvement or to do things a little bit differently. And again, if, if you've not been on video yet, you haven't been refereeing long enough. That's all there is. All of us have been on the video or on the screen, um, whether that be to model uh, best practices 
or to model something that can be done a little bit differently on the next time. All right, so let's get started. So why study positioning? What we found in uh, when, when we look at uh, the games in really, really excruciating detail uh, at the professional level is that we find about 90% of the errors in decision making on the field actually come from an issue in positioning. Um, so it really is incumbent on us to study positioning, um, how to get the best out of that in order to help make our decisions as accurate as possible. Uh, we're going to talk about a couple of the basics here, and it's really about putting it into practice at all levels of the game. Even when you're watching games during this kind of hiatus, uh, you can take some of the concepts that we're looking at and watch the referees there. You'll probably see if you look at older games when the speed of play was not as high um, or the tactics were a little bit different, you would see them apply positioning in a, in a very different style. Um, just like the game has evolved, we've had to evolve our positioning practices to keep up and, uh, and really do our best with the modern game. So when you're watching games, even if they're within the past few years, you'll start to see kind of the um, evolution of these positioning practices and how they've been put into place. Um, everything we're talking about tonight, um, is, these are guidelines, there's some recommendations. Uh, none of this is designed to be prescriptive. This is not, you must do this. Um, in, in all scenarios. Um, I don't want the, uh, the 400 all people uh, going away after tonight saying, Feeney said I need to do this um, and use that as your, as your crutch for what you're doing. Uh, these are not prescriptive. These are guidelines and some recommendations based on a lot of people's experience uh, coming in, uh, refereeing the game, um, assessing the game, observing the game, analyzing it. So it's kind of... Uh, a culmination of the thought leaders in the game uh, that we've put this together. Um, everything is really game specific. You know, if, if something that we're talking about tonight doesn't apply in, uh, in a portion of the game you're doing or the game you're doing, that's, that's no problem at all, you know? Um, but the likelihood is that you're gonna come across some, uh, some times in your game where these positioning guidelines will help you, will help you uh, get in a place where you can see what you need to see, uh, be credible in your decision, um, and have everyone believe you. Okay, so there's no definite right answer in all situations. Really, this is about giving you a couple of um, tools in your toolkit or a couple of jelly beans for your candy bag uh, to find the best option. And this is probably the most important point for everyone to take back for themselves. Each individual has to be thinking for themselves in all the various scenarios that you're going to face in your game. Okay, this is what makes refereeing actually really, really fun is that it's always a little bit different. Um, and we have the challenge of thinking our way through what's happening in front of us and picking the best option to do the best we can. Okay, so we're going to look at a video right now. Um, I'm going to play it through. And um, I just want you to uh, take a look at the video in its entirety and um, think about some things that you like what the referee is doing and some things where you think, well, this may get him into a little bit of trouble or this may not be the best option. And then we are going to, at the end of the presentation, kind of be coming back to parts of this video uh, just to check for how we've done with the, absorbing some of the concepts.
Yeah, so one of the other reasons to show to show this video is that the positioning concepts we're talking about really apply to, to all levels. Even the referees at, at the highest levels of the game um, end up not making the best op the best choices every single time, and that's okay. This is this is a process. You're not going to get every um, put into practice every best option that there is right away. But if you can start slowly and think, okay, I'm going to try this once in the first half and once in the second half and see how that feels. And if that's going well and you like how that, um, where that puts you in position and if you like your sight lines from that, then you can think, okay, in the next game, I'm going to try this a couple of times in each half. And it takes a while to build new habits. Uh, we have to look at the triggers um, that lead into those decisions. And when those decisions result in positive things and rewards, either of being confident in your decision, really having the sight lines that you need, having the angles of view, um, having less dissent from the players, having acceptance of your decisions. Um, those types of rewards then kind of work as a positive feedback loop to keep seeing those triggers and keep doing it. And, and before long, after a few weeks and a few times of trying this, uh, then that'll form itself into a new habit, which is really good. And that's how we build all of our refereeing skills. Okay, so I'm gonna move on from this video for now. We're gonna come back to it at the, end, uh, at the end of the presentation. Okay, so just to go over some best practices, kind of theoretically, what we're gonna be talking about today are um, some zones and some thirds of the field. We're gonna be talking about active play uh, rather than set piece positioning. And within that act of play, we're going to look at movement at the breakdown. And we're also going to look at body position. I'll get into those concepts a little bit more as we as we go through. Uh, we're also going to talk about angles of view, uh, which are pretty much always more important than proximity when you're talking about seeing the decision that you have to see. In general, we use angle of view to see what we need to see. And we use proximity for credibility and control of the situation. So we're always gonna be emphasizing angle of view. Um, we may go over penalty area lines a little bit if we have time at the end, but we'll see. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about continual movement, particularly in the attacking third, in that final phase of, of attacking play and having uh, agility and staying on your toes and having that continual movement. Again, all of that is going to be so that we can always give ourselves the best angle of view. And then we're going to ask an interesting question about when is a good time to go inside the penalty area? So like everything we do, we look at the FIFA considerations uh, and we use that as our primary guidelines for best practices. So when it comes to positioning, it really is going to, applying the best positioning practice is going to rely on football understanding. And football understanding is a constantly evolving process. And it applies at the youth level, it applies at the adult amateur level, even though they're not as fast as they think they used to be, but be that as it may, football understanding of tactics, how they move the ball around, what are the different ways they get the ball into the attacking third, what does a team do when they lose the ball to try and regain possession, where do they do that on the field, how do they do that on the field at what times and how these things shift when a team is uh, trying to gain a lead or trying to protect the lead or trying to catch up. Um, all of this requires flexibility, flexibility for changing scenarios in the game, changing situations in the game uh, always lead to a change in tactics. And we have to be flexible enough uh, to adjust our positioning uh, to, to be able to meet the scenarios that present themselves to us. So reading of the game is very important and you can really uh, use your team with this as well. Uh, so this is not just for referees, even though we're gonna be talking about referee positioning, where it's very, very important when you're running the line or if you're a fourth official in the games that you're doing to have an understanding of this as well, because if the referee sometimes, um, you get in situations where they're, they're so immersed in what is directly in front of them that they, can lose the bigger picture of that. And 
this is really where the team is worth its weight in gold to be able to say to the referee, um, you know, hey, they're shifting tactics. Hey, they've, uh, they've moved into this high pressure. We need, we need you here. And you don't need fancy comm systems and you don't need beeper flags. Uh, we've used analog communication for 200 years with eye contact and our voice and our body language. And um, as, as any referee can tell you who's used the comm systems, um, it is probably the most reliable thing about them is that they are unreliable at different points in the game, sometimes for long periods in the game. So being able to communicate with each other through eye contact and body language uh, and using your voice uh, is very important. And this can be for things like telling the referee, hey, that things have shifted. Hey, they're putting high pressure on. Uh, we need to adjust. I need you closer. Um, or go ahead upfield. I've got this. Um, there's various ways you can do that. Tactical knowledge of the game is also important, not only the basic formations, but what does that mean for the referee team and for our decisions? Uh, if a team is playing a long, a long ball or a counter-attacking style, this has huge implications for the referee team where the assistant referee now has to extend their patrol area out more and, and help referee the game until the referee can get there. So having the tactical knowledge of what the teams are doing in what situations um, is, uh, is going to uh, drive the types of positioning uh, demands that are put on us. Research of the teams, this is always first principles. Being able to predict as much as possible what the teams are gonna do uh, gives us fewer surprises. And, and the fewer surprises for the referee team, uh, then the, the better. Um, anytime you can research and visualize and try and predict, uh, then when it happens in front of you, you just have to recognize it, which is a lot faster than trying to figure it out uh, in the moment. So recognition always occurs faster than identification. So by doing your research, it lets you visualize things, it lets you predict which players are gonna be involved in things, it lets you recognize it quicker, and it lets you get in yourself in a, in a good position more quickly as well. And you'll be much calmer about it because you'll already have practiced it. And we touched on visualizations already. And just remember that no two situations are the same. Uh, so we've, everything that we talk about tonight, everything that you're going to see tonight, you'll never see it again. Uh, even if you bring in the same teams and the same players in the same stadium for the same reasons, no two situations, no two games are, the, are alike. So you always have to be able to have that flexibility uh, to recognize what's in front of you, but also recognize that there's not a one pattern fits all. Right? And a feel for the game. Really nothing can replace this. You're all here. Um, not just because you love the game and you love officiating the game, but really because you have a feel for the game that goes right into your core. And that feel for the game of what's fair, what's right, what's just for everyone involved, uh, that's such a, an important go-to. And that instinct is built over years of playing, years of coaching if you've coached, years of officiating, um, years of being a fan of the game. So that feel of the game, really let that be your guide into, into what's fair and to be able to tell yourself if all else fails, let, let that instinct tell you, hey, I need to be over there. Okay, so we're going to start, start out with uh, talking uh, quickly about uh, pressing and adjustment at the breakdown. So to understand adjustment at the breakdown, it's important to understand pressing. And what do I mean by pressing? We have, we're gonna just divvy this up into a couple of big buckets. So our first bucket is low or medium pressing. And what you're gonna see those visual cues for low and medium pressing is you're gonna see space surrounding the player with the ball. You might see opponents nearby, but they're probably either standing or they're walking or they're at a, uh, at a jog. The player with the ball is able to look for options. They have time. So one of the differences between youth and adult amateur and the professional level is the opponents can be a lot closer to the player with the ball and the teammates are still yelling time. At the adult amateur level, um, when a lot of us used to play or still play, uh, the opponents are a lot farther when we say man on. Uh, when, at the professional level, you think, wow, that's pressure. 
Um, but the players are so skilled at that level that they need a lot less time to accomplish the same things. So that's going to be one of the adjustments if you're refereeing youth, competitive youth, recreational youth, or adult amateur is what is low or medium pressing versus high pressing may shift a little bit. And that's okay. You'll get a feel for that. You'll have a sense of it, of what is high pressure here. And high pressure is really when with the player with the ball um, is being forced to make a decision or is forced into a rush decision of some sort. Um, so the pace that the opponent is coming at them or the amount of space that they have is going to vary a little bit. That's going to kind of go back and forth. But what isn't different is that at low or medium pressing, the player can look for options. Whereas with high pressing, there's a lack of space or that space is closing down quickly for that level of player. The opponents are running at speed, even if that speed is slower at the youth or adult amateur level than it is at the professional or international level, it's still at speed. Uh, second, all right, that's fine. And we have this idea of individual versus team pressing. So I don't want us to get too wrapped up in necessarily one player going at uh, an opponent at speed. That we have to notice that if we're the referee. Certainly if you're the assistant referee, you have to notice it just in case something bad happens and that player with the ball makes a poor decision. But once you start getting into team pressing, this is something now that's going to require some more overt action from the referee to adjust their positioning. So notice if it's individual, act if it's team. Okay, another visual cue from the player with the ball when there's high pressing is that the player has their head down and they may start doing protective action, start turning their body, start putting an arm out, doing some of these things to try and protect the ball because now they're under high pressure. So again, what you're gonna notice is that this, um, is applicable to the youth level, amateur level, professional level. It's applicable to boys' games, to girls' games, to men's games, and to women's games. It's applicable to all games. Okay, so these are the, some of the visual cues that I want us to start looking for when we play the video. So let's talk about high pressing a little bit and one aspect of positioning with high pressing. And the question I'm going to ask is, if there's high pressing, do we want to be further from that high pressing than the adjacent zone? So what I've done is I've shown you a field over here. When there's a high press, say the team with the ball is in this end and they're going from the top of the field to the bottom of the field, high press is when the defending team is trying to win the ball back in the opponent's final third. So this is a high press in terms of the field, and this is where you may see one individual go at the player with the ball. That may be only in certain times of the game. A team may try and do that only for the first couple of minutes. That takes a lot of energy. So after the first few minutes, if nothing comes of it, they may back off, and then they may try again later in the half. So it could be certain times of the game, when an individual goes and does this high pressing, it could be times in the game where a two or three players from a team high presses, and it's maybe not that they want to win the first ball necessarily, or high press and force anything from the player who's making the, who has the ball currently, but the team high press means when that player passes it to the next player, you'll have the next opponent coming in at speed, and that decision is rushed a little more. And then after that, you'll get the third player coming in at speed to rush that pass even more. And then hopefully within that series of individual high pressing um, coming across the team, the one, the two, the three, maybe on the second pass or the third pass, now that they're getting more and more rushed, a team is able to regain possession of the ball in the other uh, opponent's attacking, uh, I'm sorry, in the other opponent's uh, defensive end in there. So when we talk about a high press in, in here, where do we want the referee? The assistant referee is great because they're gonna be with the ball. So that's kind of automatic and that part is prescriptive. For the referee, do we wanna be further than the next zone? 
So if the press is up here, as referees, we probably don't want to be any further away than this kind of mid midfield area. Pressing in the middle third, so maybe they give them this first kind of defensive third. It could be that the midfielders, maybe the attackers are doing a jog back, and that midfield line is the first line where they're doing high press. So if that's where they're doing their press as the referees, we probably don't want to be more than the adjacent zone. Because if a turnover happens, we want to be able to use that explosive movement that we've got, have that first 10, 15 yards uh, of sprint ability to be able to then uh, get ourselves some proximity, but more importantly, have, give ourselves the time to get a good angle of view for the next decision. Okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit about pressing uh, in, in those terms. Okay, so let's look at a, a little video here. I'm gonna play it through and then um, we'll stop it at a couple of places. Okay, so we have a goal kick happening here. This is the dark team. That's a, an example of an individual high press. All right, so what we've got are a few visual cues here to help us out. All right, the first one is the situational awareness. So we've got a goal kick happening from the, dark, from the blue team, and we've got two attackers here way at the top of, of the penalty area. So right away, if the referee is pretty up high towards midfield, what is the likelihood that this team is in a position to do a long ball into the middle third? This is where we have to read the game, read the body shape of the players, and say, what's more likely? They're going to do a big boom ball here to midfield, or are they looking to do a short pass and build it out of the back? This is where reading the game comes into play. This is where we, we gain a lot of information during dead ball time to sort of read what the players are going to do next. So this is not the time to mentally relax. This is the time to say, okay, how can I predict what's happening next? If the referee is way up, up field here. The assistant referee can absolutely do some communication to the referee to say, hey, I think they're going short here and we've got some high pressure coming in. You know, what say we get a little bit closer? So we talked about the visual cues of the player running at speed and closing down the space very quickly. Okay, and when that happens, the danger of staying up here is that now if we have a turnover here, we have the magic penalty area, and if there's a turnover, that's where the defenders are going to get desperate. So we have a potential with this high pressure, we have a potential for a penalty area decision that could result in a penalty kick and a disciplinary sanction, potentially for stopping a promising attack or denying an obvious goal scoring opportunity. By being up in here, we're putting all of those most important decisions of the game really on the shoulders of the assistant referee, who is thinking, not my job, if I can help it. And they have to do that from distance. And they don't have real flexibility in gaining angles of view to really get a good look at the contact. So it's really incumbent on the referee for good teamwork to recognize the formation here. It's incumbent on the assistant referee to say, hey, we need you a little bit closer in so that I'm not put into the jackpot of making decisions in the penalty area from distance. And how much credibility does the assistant referee have making a penalty area decision? Some but not as much as it could be from the referee being closer. So when the play breaks down, we're gonna kind of shift gears a little bit. We, under, we went over pressing and the reason we wanted to go over pressing at the beginning is because when the play breaks down, we have to look to see, is a team going to do a high press 
right away, which means we may have another decision to make, or are they going to be backing off? If there's lower medium pressure on the ball, then we want to look at that breakdown of play and start having that be our first trigger in adjusting our position. So do we want to look at, do we want to be chasing behind the play after it breaks down? What's the best way to get a good angle of view? And what are our visual cues that the play is broken down? Some to consider are a clear loss of possession or the body shape of the player lining up for a long pass. So let's take a look at some video here. Okay, so we've got green in possession right now. As we play through it, right, we've got a clear breakdown in the play. So green has given up possession, and now we have a turnover. This is what we're calling the breakdown of play. So the play for green is broken down. What I want to do is start it over, and I want you to look at the actions of the referee. You can already tell from the referee's body shape of what they're doing. It's recognizing that there's been a turnover in possession and that there is low pressure on the player now with the ball. And that is triggering the new movement, the explosive movement, and gaining the new position. So I'm just going to start it over here and let it play. Okay, we have a breakdown of play. We have explosive movement, not for very long, 10 meters, maybe 15 meters. There's low pressure there, and now the referee is able to get to the next phase of play. Okay, so I just want you to look again at that initial movement and for how long that sprint is. There's the breakdown. That's probably about, again, 10, 15 meters. Okay, so it's not a long, a long drawn out sprint. Over here, this is where the breakdown of play occurred. I'm sorry, the clip doesn't, uh, doesn't hit that. It faded a little bit early, but blue had possession of the ball. There was an aerial challenge. And as often happens in the midfield on these aerial challenges, uh, there's a, a turnover. So the ball is now turned over. White has possession. And again, let's look at what the referee does. It's not even a full sprint. It's just a tempo run for about 10, 15 meters. This is low pressure for the professional game. Right, so I'm just going to pause here for the moment and uh, see if there's any questions. I'm going to hand over to Kevin uh, to see if we've got any questions so far in terms yep. of positioning, high pressing, or adjustment at the breakdown. Yep. We actually have a few questions. Uh, first one is going to go to Nat Alderman. And Nat, what we're going to do is actually unmute you and let you ask your question directly with Amy. Okay. Let's try that again. Um, I was actually going to ask, and you answered it, um, what you meant by a breakdown. So I, I, you, you definitely covered that well. But thanks. Thanks. Can you tell us all what, what you got out of that? What are, what are your... Um, um... So the, the change of possession was the primary cue of a breakdown or the, the high pressure on that um, the player that uh, was in danger of losing the ball. So those, those are the keys there. Good. Yep, so there's a clear loss of possession and what's gonna trigger the movement of the referee, that first initial movement? How much pressure can there be on uh, the team that has now newly gained possession? Thank you. Okay, we have a question from Jeff Artis. Jeff, you're next. Hi, Sandra, great clips. Um, you cautioned us at the beginning of this that uh, many of us won't use comms on a regular basis and you can't always rely on them, yet you pointed out a really good situation in a high-level game where the referee, by being too far upfield, is putting too much pressure on an AR, responsibility on an AR and maybe getting himself in trouble by not being close enough to the penalty area. 
-hmm. If you don't have comms in that situation, is there a good way to communicate that if you're maybe a more experienced AR and you see that danger in the in dynamic play? I mean, you can talk about it at halftime or afterwards, but how can you communicate that while the play's going on? Yell real loud. So part of part of part of your pregame is going to be if you're the referee, part of the pregame is going to be instructions to your assistants to say, if you need to get my attention, this is what I want you to do. So at this point, it would be, you know, instead, you're not going to yell, hey, ref, because everybody yells that. Right. So as a referee, you can say, hey, if I hear this real loud coming from you, I know you want my attention. If you don't get eye contact from me right away, and we have a dead ball situation like this, go ahead and take a step onto the field and yell my name. Because if nothing else, I'm going to look over and say, well, that's strange. Why is my AR on the field? And at that point, once you have my attention, you can project your voice as best as possible. Or at that point, you can at least use some body language. Now, if you can point out, if you just point to here or point to the attacker and bring your hand in to say, get closer, uh, so the main part that you're going to use your voice for is gaining the attention of the referee. And you, we have to sort that out. And if you're an AR on the game and the referee doesn't cover how to get their attention, then go ahead and ask. Say, hey, if I need to get your attention and you're far away, what's, what's the best way I can get your attention you know, from the line? Sort that out from beforehand and then apply it during the game. Yeah. But again, that, vo that voice, you're not going to um, really – say an entire sentence from far away because you're going to lose that. But once you get the attention, then you can use some hand gestures, some of your body language to point and say, hey, there's an attacker there, you know, come in, get closer. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Usually we think of that as being to deal with a specific incident rather than a developing problem. But what that also does is it lets the players know um, that you're aware just as though you might yell loudly, hey, five and six, knock it off, and everybody exactly. knows you're looking at them. So good point. Mm -hmm. I like that. Yep. Awesome. Yeah, great. It's a great question because a lot of people say, well, you know, it doesn't matter if you have comms or not. But, it, I mean, it certainly makes life easier. So, um, but remember, you have voice to get the attention. You have body language. You have hand gestures. And I'm a big believer in finding a solution. Um, you know, we, we go out there uh, as, as officials and it's not because we feel helpless as people in our, in our daily lives. I think one of the, the things that draw all of us to officiating is because we are able to find solutions to problems. So there's really very few situations I can think of where anyone is helpless. You find a way. And it may not be pretty and it may not, um, you know, be the smoothest thing but i'd rather have a little awkward moment and have the big decision uh get done right or prevent a big problem from happening so there are only solutions find a way light your flag on fire if you have to i don't know something the next question is coming from katie mccormick katie hey katie hey feeny how's it going good how are you hun good good thanks for your time good. um so I think my question is just uh, goes to this clip, the um, Seattle Sounders clip. Uh, so in PRO right now, with the new goal kick rule, are you telling referees to kind of pinch up and be closer to the penalty area just in case, um, like in the situation that there are attackers close to the penalty area? I'm sorry, are you talking about this clip here? Uh, yes, that one. So there, there's the two attackers there. So are you telling them to kind of pinch up there? Would you say to be more in the attacking third just to kind of anticipate that? Or are you still telling, like still having them be back there closer to the center circle? Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. Um, so like we said at the beginning, there's, there's nothing prescriptive here. Yeah. It's, it's True. really about, it's really about reading the game and reading the scenario that's developing in front of you. So if there's two attackers here, um, this comes in part of your research as well, potentially. Mm -hmm. You know, so do, it does Seattle, is that part of their tactical plan that on all these short goal kicks, if their opponents are building out of the back, do they station a couple of people here? If there are a couple of people here and they let them play, then there's really no decision to be made. Mm -hmm. So there's no reason to come forward. 
any, any closer to that. And we're not saying to come all the way to the top of the penalty area because that's one boom ball away exactly. from a decision in the next penalty area. Yeah. So what we're saying is take a look at, you know, if, if you can predict it by the research or maybe the first couple of plays, yeah. if you okay. see high pressure in here, then you can, you can hedge a little bit. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be extreme, but having the referee, what does it do being five yards closer at this point, potentially as a starting position? Yeah. So if we're in a starting position, maybe five, six yards closer, if the attackers are just standing there and letting them build out of the back, then there's nothing to see here and we can zip right back yeah. to, where we, to where we started and see how the play develops. If we're, it's really about being, being ready for it. Mm -hmm. If we see this, I'm already, I have a suspicion, you know, are they just gonna stand there? Probably someone's gonna run in for high pressure. So if that works out and I'm already kind of looking at it and once it, once we start looking at the play, this is who, now they're on this side here, boom, I'm gone, I'm gone as well. So I'm taking my cue from this player. Yeah, got it. Already, so if we start a little closer and I see them moving in, I'm, I'm able to move in, to move in uh, a little bit closer. And again, it does, the referee doesn't have to run all the way up to the penalty area, to the top here. We're close enough to be able to say, if I have a decision, am I able to get myself an angle of view on any potential contact? And do I have credibility in my decision? Makes sense. Awesome, thank you. Awesome, thank you. Okay. Uh, next question and the last one for this little round would be uh, Sarah Gaddis. Sarah, go ahead. Hey, Sarah. Hey, hi, Sandra. My question was more just related to general positioning. I've noticed that in my games, I get caught a lot of times trying to transition from more of a defensive part of the field mm -hmm. to more of an attacking side. Because usually when I'm in the defensive part, I try to stay ahead of play. But then whenever play transitions, I always try to focus more on my angles. But sometimes I get caught. Um, do you have any tips for that? Is that just something you have to practice with awareness? Yeah, so I think... Uh if I'm visualizing this, this is, this is uh, not uncommon um, with officials is that it's a lot easier to kind of do that initial movement ahead of play from the defensive to the middle third. And then we kind of get stuck because that's where a lot of um, that mid block that we talked about a little earlier, that's where you're going to start to get a lot more challenges. So we feel compelled to stay in that middle zone because we have decisions to make, but at the same time, then we're getting caught up in some of the active player space. Is am I am I kind of mm -hmm. visualizing yeah, exactly. that correctly? So uh, I'll try and do it through kind of this uh, through this clip here. So we're going to have to play a little bit of imagination land. Oh, sorry about that. Let me get over to here. So right in this middle zone here. Again, the first thing we're going to look at is is pressure. If you start having high pressure in here, you know, then it doesn't make sense to pop way, way ahead of the play. You can still get ahead of this as long as you have an angle that, looks in that sees in between the players and sees the ball. But the other key for it is wherever you um, end up, one piece of advice is kind of this area here, the center circle in particular, and right near the center circle tends to be where the player space is. So one recommendation is to always be moving kind of at pace through the center circle. And what that'll do is that will get you to the edges generally, if play is kind of in this, in this big central blob, that'll get you over to the edges of the active playing zone, open up your view a little bit, and you'll still have the ability to see between players. Um, what's our enemy there is coming to a stop and standing. That, that's really where, where we find that um, officials get caught up quite a bit in active player zones and they lose their angles and they feel like they're in the way or they feel like everything now is all of a sudden too close to them. So being able to have some continuous movement in there, but if, when you find yourself coming to this area, See if you can transition through the center circle and pick an edge and just transition that pace. So if we're coming ahead a little bit here, 
let's say there's a challenge. Let's say this is, this is a, a challenge here instead of them dumping the ball back negatively. If we started here and we come across that pace to the other side, in it, we're still able to get an angle of view or we can cross that pace you know, to this side. You don't necessarily have to be close. You can still be 10, 12 yards. Um, if for that moment, your best position is in here, that's fine. But you wanna be thinking, I don't wanna be standing here. So it's always doing that quick transition out. And then once play resolves, <coughs> then you can get to the top, the top portion of that middle zone. And then once it really goes in the attacking third, then you're gonna follow play in from there. Right, thank you. You're welcome. All right, uh, for those of you that want to ask questions, uh, please take uh, the um, link that's in the chat window, copy it into a separate browser, the Google form will pop up, and then uh, you'll be able to submit your questions for Feeny. Okay, Feeny, go right ahead. Okie doke. All right, we're gonna um, switch over now into positioning in the final third. Okay, so we have some, some general zones and I wanted to go over a little bit. Um, we talked about being ahead of the play as when we adjust for the breakdown and come out of the defensive third. We can be a little bit ahead of the play when play is in the middle third, um, obviously with the adjustments made for how much pressure there is on the player. So now that we're coming into the final third, this is the place now where we want to switch. And instead of being ahead of it when play is in the attacking third, this is where we want to allow play to get ahead of us and us be behind it. Because play at that point generally has stopped a really strong forward momentum. It gets a little bit more static at that point. So once play becomes static in that attacking final third, strangely enough, that's when we become more dynamic in our movement. If we end up getting ahead of things in the final third, there's several pitfalls there. So if play comes into the final third and then has to come back out again, if we're ahead of it, then we have to turn ourselves around to look at play here and we have our backs to the next phase of play, which is in that magical penalty area where all the fun happens. And the last thing we want to do is turn our back to where all the fun happens and where our biggest decisions are. So by letting play be ahead of us, and that's gonna be, you know, it's kind of like a lava lamp. It's not always gonna be a hard line. It's always gonna kind of ebb and flow in here, but as best we can, if we keep play ahead of us in this attacking third, it always gives us a forward view of the next phase of play, which is going into the penalty area, which is again, where all the fun happens. Okay, so let's take a look at a clip to just kind of demonstrate demonstrate that. I'll let this play through and then we'll go over uh, some of the points in there. Okay, so I'm going to play it again and just get to the points where Okay, so this one, this one here at this, at this stage of, of the play, now that we've talked about pressing, I don't know if you can do votes on here, um, but I think we're all safe in, <laughs> in saying this is low pre a low pressure situation. So when there's low pressure or no pressure, there's really no decision for us to make. So there's not much to see here. We don't want to turn our backs to the player with the ball because again, their body shape is going to give us a lot of information as to where they're going next. And that lets us put our eyes to the next phase, which again helps us predict what our next decision is going to be. So we don't want to completely ignore them, but we don't need 100% of our brain on here. We need maybe five or 10% of our brain here to predict what he's going to do next. Um, and we know that by the way he's facing, about his body shape, if that's going to be a short pass, a long pass, a really boom, big boom ball serving it into the penalty area. So right now we just need a little bit of brain resource to figure out what's going to happen here. Where we really want to gain information, because it's going to be a lot more complex, is what are the players off the ball doing? 
Who's looking to receive this ball? Who's open? Who's marked? Who's starting to go into the penalty area? Because now I have to adjust my position to get my angle of view for the next decision. So in these types of situations, we're looking to kind of split and, and switch our focus a little bit quickly. Very, very quick glance here because it doesn't take much to figure out what, what this player is going to do. And we want to have most of our focus on figuring out what's coming next and giving ourselves as much time as possible to figure that out. So short pass. Again, this is still low pressure, not much to see here. So being ahead of things is okay because they're not in the final third yet, but we want to adjust ourselves a little bit so we keep a part of our focus here, but more of our focus on, say, this player or this player um, if, to see if the ball is going to go into the penalty area. In this clip over here, so let me just pull that back a smidge. So as play comes to this side, this is really where we have the, where we have the breakdown, right? So we have blue in possession. There's our, oops, sorry about that. That's where our breakdown is. So when blue had possession and coughed it up to white. So we have a, a breakdown of play, and now it's coming centrally. This is the time for the referee now to be backpedaling out of this area into space that the players aren't using. This is all really congested. The challenge is going to be in here. That's this moment. But the next phase, we have to see who gets possession at this point. Okay, we have another, another turnover. So now we have blue gaining possession. Because we didn't move this 10 yards, when white put the ball back into the central area, now we get caught here. We have our back to goal, and we don't know what the next phase is going to be. So if this is a quick chip inside the penalty area, we give ourselves a lot less time to make any kind of decision that's going to occur. So as the ball switches channels from the side into the central area, all we need to do from where we started is backpedal out, not even 10 yards, and gain ourselves an open view. If white gains possession, right, then we're in a place where we can move ahead quickly. Blue gains possession, then we're in a position where we can see our assistant referee, and we can also see the movement of the players coming in for the next phase. Okay, eventually turns around. So I wanna talk a little bit about what it, we, we stay in that center lane because it's convenient. We saw in the last portion of that last clip that even though the ball had moved to that center lane, um, as a referee, we often find ourselves uh, staying there. And it is really important that if the ball is coming towards you, that we want to get into that next channel because we're not going to play the ball, or at least not on purpose. So we know that when the ball moves into the next channel, say from near the touchline into the center area, the players are going to congregate there. Especially if it's a loose ball, everybody has hope. And as I've said many, many times in many venues, nothing good comes from hope. So when you have everybody hoping that they're going to gain possession of the ball, we need to make sure we're in a position where we have a good view of things. And um, there's nothing worse than being in that state of mind where are thinking, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, I need to get out, I need to get out. We're in a panic situation, we're moving just wherever, and we're taking our mind off of the decision that we have to make. So it's important to kind of move there. So the center area, when we talk about the center lane, if you think of kind of a bowling alley between 
kind of the edges of the goal area, coming to the edges of the penalty arc, which coincidentally enough, if you keep going downfield, then get at the edges of the center circle and, um, and so on to the next pe penalty arc to the next goal area. That center lane there is really high traffic. So like we talked about when Sarah asked her question earlier, it's okay, the field is the field, but if we have any, um, any choice in the matter, we really wanna be transitioning through that center lane at pace. So even if you're doing five, six games a day or whatever it is people are doing at the youth level, uh, even if you're not running around a lot, whatever, whenever you are running, wherever you're gonna save your energy, save it for transitioning through that center lane at a higher pace uh, than you do normally. And it'll get yourself out of there and hence out of the player's space. So let's look at a couple of clips, or let's look at this clip here, which again, just kind of demonstrates the pitfalls of being in that center area. Okay, we're trying to get in close by, and we just sent set a pick for the attacking team. Okay, so this is where it's gonna be tempting for us to probably come in the center lane. We probably like to see the referee already on this side of the field. <coughs> so we have the breakdown, right? We've got team kind of team pressure here. We've got a breakdown of play with um, an absolutely horrific pass. Uh, to the other team from, oh, I don't know, 20 yards out from goal. Um, so again, if we're looking uh, as this play is, is developing, we can see three players there. Sometimes it's not a matter of the team putting pressure on and gaining possession, but, but errors from the other team. And this is, you know, a huge reason for turnovers at all levels of the game. So we've got a turnover there. We've got an attacker. So Totally understand the referee is not doing too badly. He's probably thinking, what the heck? Uh, the goalkeeper just passed it to an attacker. But if we transition quickly through the center lane, we're going to end up somewhere around here, which gives us a good angle of view on a potential penalty area decision. And it still keeps us open to be able to see our AR be facing this. And then if the ball comes back out, we're in a position to readjust. So let's do a, a quick transition past that penalty arc. You can use the markings on the field. If you see anything like a penalty arc or a center circle, think, okay, run faster. And we, we just get, again, it's not far. It's only another 10 meters or so. So if we can get there, then as the ball gets crossed, if we're already starting here, we still have a great angle of view. Right? And then we avoid this. So this is the pitfalls of being in the center lane. If we can go at pace, even if we started here and when the ball was crossed, we went at pace to the other side, we'd still be okay. Where the danger comes in is stopping in our bowling alley here. Okay, so just imagine if this attacker were able to challenge for the ball here or even potentially take a shot on goal. Instead, what ends up happening is the ball comes back out and Green has to recycle the ball, reset, and it gives the defending team a chance to reset as well, which is kind of not fair. Right, so when we talk about body position, we've talked a little bit about that, and we started kind of creeping into that area of body position uh, in the last clip. Um, we really want to be able, as best we can, to have our body position to get uh, an angle of view that has a side-on view. And strangely enough, this is the view that all the coaches have from the touchline and, and the view that the AR has often. But the coaches have a lot of side-on views, um, which makes them think they see a lot. Um, but strangely enough, sometimes they actually do see see quite a bit. And we're running north-south, and so we have to work a little extra hard to get to get those side-on view uh, angles. And 
depending on the position of the players, our body position on the field is going to be in various spots. But what we're aiming for is to get a side on view so you can see in between the players while also seeing the ball. Okay, and a lot of times, the reason we don't get that is because we end up becoming flat footed. We end up taking little breaks in there, but our best friend is really making those smaller adjustments. Sometimes it's only a step or two. And this is where our lateral movement training comes in. It's just being able to take one or two lateral steps to have that side on view and just to gain that angle. So you can see in between the players as well as get a view of the ball. And what that allows for us to do is it lets us see that exact moment of contact. And that's where you can really zoom in and use your considerations for fouls and, and misconduct uh, severity. So you'll really be able to see, you know, did they make contact with the studs? Was it glancing? Did they get the ball first? Uh, where did the foot land? Um, you'll be able to see all of those things if you have that side on view contact. Okay, and that's the difference between seeing the player playing the ball here versus a player coming in with excessive force and endangering the safety of the opponent. Okay, so it's really important for that. It also lets us see the speed and movement of the players challenging. This one in particular, it's important not to be too close to the play. Um, because it, and it's important not to be too focused on the ball. By having a wide view most of the time and only zooming in at the very last moment, by being zoomed out, and not being entirely focused on the ball, it lets you see the speed and the distance that the players are coming, which is a huge consideration when we're looking at foul severity or misconduct severity. And it also lets us see uh, the, um, the movement that the players are making. Um, are they coming in with a straight leg? Are they coming in with studs exposed? Are they launching? themselves off the ground? Are they lunging? Uh, so it's important to be a little bit, um, have enough proximity to have some credibility in there, but not be too close where you lose that movement and that speed uh, of the players coming into challenge. All right, so finding some angles along the penalty area lines. What do we mean by this? This next clip that I'm going to show you really just kind of shows that when there's decisions to be made near the edges of the penalty area and not the top edge, because we have the assistant referee to help us with the top edge of the penalty area, whether something in or out, but those lines that are parallel to the touch lines, um, those ones were on our own as a referee. So it's important to get an angle of view that lets us see inside or outside. Uh, and this is just a really positive, uh, clip with some really good practices here that shows the referee making adjustments for that. Okay, so there's a couple of really, really positive things about this clip. When we see the adjust, there's a, a breakdown, so we're expecting now the referee to use explosive movement. You can see that they come into the frame really, really quickly here. So this is really nice. Got good proximity, got plenty of credibility in here. As this player comes towards the penalty area, the referee now, our habits tend to be, we're just gonna keep going in a straight line. And if we keep going in a straight line, we, will, we have to guess a lot more if there's a decision right near the edge of right near the, the, this penalty area line. And what the referee does really, really well here is just takes a little bit of a different approach. It doesn't take him out of the path by a lot, maybe only three yards, but takes the referee into the path where they've got now an angle of view that if there's any decision surrounding this line, they have the credibility to make it and they've given themselves an angle of view to see it. And when you have that, it shows in your body language, it shows in your whistle, 
the players accept the decision a lot more. And when you feel sure about something like that, it just oozes right out of you. And the players really pick up on that. So the investment of moving three yards here to gain an angle buys you a whole bunch of good stuff. Okay, that play resolved. And now the referee makes another very small adjustment. Just adjust back another yard or so, just in case there's anything that's happening here. And now he's working really, really hard. It's not doesn't want to stay in a straight line here. This isn't the, the best angle, but you just need to move a little bit over here to get yourself an angle that sees between the players. You've already got a view of the ball here. So the referee is working really, really hard to get that angle. And whenever you find yourself kind of chasing play like this uh, in the attacking third, just think for yourself, angle, 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 angle. And it's a small investment of maybe one or two yards, maybe three yards to either side, but you fight for that angle. You fight for that angle every single time, and it's going to pay you back. All right, and now get adjust again and see that it's a good tackle, a good challenge from, uh, from Orlando. Okay, um, want to get into body position a little bit. These are some take homes for you. You can, when you watch uh, games on TV, you can see if the referees are implementing this. And this is something that you can get in the habit of if, if you're able to go outside and do a little bit, if you have a soccer field nearby, or even a couple of t-shirts for goalposts and, and uh, a couple of cones or something for an imaginary penalty area. This is something you can practice on your own. And, and the, one of the most helpful things is that when play is in the final third is to keep your shoulders square to the goal line. Play is going to be ahead of you already in this and keeping your shoulders square to the goal line is going to give you uh, the widest view possible. And so you can see everything from play to your left and you can swivel your head and actually see your AR when you need to as well. So let's take a look. Let's take a look at that. Oops. Right, so this is what we mean by having our shoulders square to the goal line. So the goal line is going this way, and our shoulders are square to it, and we use our head to see play here. And at a glance, we can see play here. Okay, and it's really important, particularly as play comes down the flank or down near the touch line, near the, near the assistant referee. This is pretty isolated, so we don't need to be close by. The offside is pretty static, so the AR can, al always, um, can also help out a little bit. So we have isolated play. We have an assistant referee who's kind of got an easy moment in the game um, because there's no dynamic offside line here. So we don't have to be really close to this. This is a nice area where the referee triangulates between uh, these areas. We have an opponent here, and what do we know about attackers? As soon as this ball gets crossed, we have all kinds of shenanigans here. We may have a shenanigan from a defender who pulls the attacker down early. We may have an attacker who doesn't think this is a good ball, so just feels some contact and goes down. By having our shoulders square to the goal line, we give ourselves a lot more time to see this play develop. And it's really safe for us to have a look at it once the ball is in the air. If we're in love with the ball and staring at the ball, we're going to miss all the fun here. Okay, so we can keep a little bit of an eye on that. That doesn't take a lot of resource going on here, but having our shoulders square makes it really easy for our head just to go on a swivel. And as soon as this play resolves with the ball, then we can look here and make the decision that we need to make, whether it's a penalty kick, whether it's no penalty kick, whether it's simulation, or whether it's a whole lot of nothing and a whole big nothing burger. Okay, so that's what that looks like. So what we wanna do is we wanna have a view of both, of, of both phases when the ball's not been delivered. You saw the last still shot going from near the touch line into the center of the field. And in this picture, we have an example where we've gotten ahead of play, um, rightly so, because there's no pressure on the player with the ball. But what we want to avoid is having our back to the player with the ball. So we saw a few clips ago that we still want to have a body position that gives us the information we need from this player, which is where are they going next? Are they going short? 
Are they going negative? Are they going forward? Are they going long? Are they going to launch it into the penalty area? Um, this gives us the information. This is like the, the tea leaves of where our next decision is going to be. Okay, but we don't need our full brain on this player like we saw back in the last clip, but we don't want to go to the other extreme either, which is turning our back to them entirely. Okay, so we really want our body position in a way where we have a view of both bases. Even if it's not an equal view, we still need to have a quarter of an eye here, even though three quarters of our focus is going to be on the next phase. Okay, and in this, in this one here, I say have your AR in view if possible. Um, if it's not possible in the moment, so be it. But anytime there's active or dynamic play going on, if it's possible, try to have your AR in view. Um, not only for flags, um, but also in case they have information for you or in case they um, have other types of information to give to you. So when we had the earlier question of when the AR yells out, hey, five and six, knock it off, if you have your AR not in your focus so much, but at least having um, have them in your peripheral vision, if they're giving out information, if they're talking to players or they have information for you, it's a lot easier to communicate that way. It's a lot easier to receive communication. It's also a lot easier to provide communication to the AR, even if it's without the comm systems. Okay, so if it's possible, try to include them in your view there. Okay, and this is where we talk about continual movement. Um, the concept of continual movement, of not watching play move around, um, not watching play move around you, this can also apply into the middle third when it gets really congested in there. And I know with um, really at all levels of the game, that midfield area just feels like it could be a slog. It feels like every second or third touch is a turnover. It feels like play gets really static in there. And we do have to be there because that's where a lot of our control fouls are. That's where a lot of decisions are. But try to avoid the temptation of turning into a potted plant and just standing there for prolonged periods of time where play is moving around you. Because before you know it, play is going to come on top of you. Okay, so if we can have uh, continual movement, that's phenomenal. If we can have at least intermittent continual movement, that's okay too. So try not to stand still for too long. Okay, we really want to be able to do that to make it easier to open up the path pathways that the players are using. Okay, so this, this example here is just really, really good of the continual movement we're talking about. It's not sprinting, it's not plyometrics, it's not happy feet, it's just nice, calm, continual movement in and around the penalty areas where this one is, but this could also apply into the middle third of the field. So again, just to, just to be able to see this one again. Right, first phase is done. It would be really tempting just to stand here. And this is what we see a lot of. The first play is resolved and we're like, okay, I'm done. But at the next play, the referee doesn't stop moving. It's just a series of little scenarios where they're doing small adjustments to give themselves the best angle of view. Right, isn't too close close enough to be credible, but just moving in small ways to now get a good angle of view on the next decision here. Oh. Right, still a good view. And now that it's going to the goalkeeper, again, ready to cut. Just as athletic as the players. Right? And if you're not able to be um, in a point in your training where you're just as athletic of, as the players, you can still take small portions of this and sprinkle them like some nice hot sauce in your movement in your own game. Okay, it doesn't have to be for 90 minutes like this, but I think everyone who's coming out to referee can do this once a half, maybe twice a half. If you're gonna save that for anywhere, Save it for around the penalty area. If 
you have the ability to sprinkle it a little bit more, add the middle third of the field to that. Okay, so it doesn't have to be all the time, but I think everyone has the ability and the energy to be able to do it, you know, once a half, twice a half. Do it as much as possible. But if you're going to do it anywhere, the penalty area is where you want it because that's the magical area where all the fun happens. Okay, play resolves and the referee is done. Uh, so just in, in, we're going to just go through one, one final concept here and then we'll open it up for questions. We want to talk about the penalty area a little bit. And we've got kind of two sides of the coin in terms of um, going inside the penalty area. So when we started, started off here, we talked about proximity really being for credibility and control of the situation. Um, we talk about angle of view to see the decision. So a lot of times in the penalty area, especially when play is dynamic, if we get sucked in too early, it really provides um, a lot of opportunity for us to get either an assist on a goal uh, or a concussion as the play gets cleared by, by the defense. So I wanna caution uh, us to um, just be really careful if you're gonna enter the penalty area uh, to make sure that it's not too close in time to the decision that you're making and also where it happens and where kind of the safe space is for that. And a lot of times we're so focused on the play at hand and we run to get really close to it and we go inside the penalty area. And the problem is that we finish with that decision, but play hasn't finished. And so in the next phase of play, now we get stuck in the, in the player pathways and, and in really problematic positions. So, uh, we're going to look at um, look at a clip here, and this is really the the pitfalls of this when we're too close. It's really restrictive. We have a danger with the players, and we really lose our angle of views, which are most important in the penalty area. Okay, so I'm going to let this play clip uh, this clip play all the way through. Right, we've gone in the penalty area for that first decision, and. We've just wiped out a defender. So what I want to emphasize here is like, yeah, that's great. This is, this is one decision. If the ball ends up in the back of the net or in the goalkeeper's hands or out of bounds, it's safe for us to go into the penalty area because the entire play is resolved. But in this situation, right? So in here, the referee is in a really, really nice, nice spot has a good angle of views, looking between the players, can see the ball, and has absolutely enough proximity to be credible. It was really focused on the angle of view here, which is awesome. When we get to the next stage, this is where we get into trouble because now we have a loose ball, which means it can go anywhere. It could absolutely go anywhere. If we need to go inside the penalty area to gain an angle of view on the next decision, Remember what we talked about now with the center lane. Convenient, but really restrictive. And in the player's way. So if we have to go into the penalty area to gain an angle of view, if we just come out to the outside of this, where there's no players, we have enough of an escape route if the ball comes back out this way, but we still have our angle of views to make our decision and to be credible. So again, it's not far. This is three or four yards, right? Three or four meters. And at this point, if it's three or four meters to the right, if that's what lets you see it, beautiful. I love it. I love your position when you can see what you need to see and you get the decision right. Wherever you were in that, in that scenario, I love your position, okay? So I know a lot of us keep hearing we have to be to the left, to the left, to the left. Sure, if, you, if, it's, uh, if it's doable, uh, then that is helpful because it opens you up to the, to the AR. But in this scenario here, there's nothing for the AR to tell us. Our priority is on making the next decision. So in this case here, if coming to the right of the ball is what lets us see what we need to see and be out of everybody's way, 
absolutely go for it. Absolutely go for it. But just remember, if this is a loose ball, have an escape plan in place. Okay, what we want to avoid is this. Right, because if this player scores and that defending player didn't have a chance to defend the ball, uh, it's going to make for a really, really long day at the office for us. Okay, so just to wrap up our FIFA considerations, whatever position gives you the best decision, we love it. Everybody loves it. Okay, but what we want to be thinking about is not only the immediate phase, but also that next phase. Okay, and being able to think about that next phase, our opportunities for that is when there's low pressure on the player with the ball, or even medium pressure. Even when there's medium pressure, we have time to take a quick glance. Okay, so always be thinking immediate phase and next phase. Right, working with your team. You might need a tap on the shoulder or twang on the ear or a rock thrown at you from the, from the touchline from the AR, but work with your team. Remember to go over how best to get my attention if you, if you, if you need it. If I'm not reading play, you know, get my attention and give me a hand gesture that clues me in. If you, know, if you see me caught on a counterattack, referee the best you can until I get there. And hope for offside or a foul coming out. That's always nice. Um, we we'll go over our responsibilities with our team. Ultimately, if you can sell your decision, that's phenomenal. And if your decision happen, happens to be correct on top of it, so much the better. Right? But a lot, and, and I say that come somewhat facetiously, but a lot of times it's whether the players believe you sometimes even more with, than if you have the correct decision. So remember proximity for credibility and control. Don't get too close to the play when you have to make your decision because it's going to cut down your angles and fight, fight, fight for your angle of view. All right, that is a wrap. So I will open it back up to Kevin um, to field some questions. All right, Sweeney. Uh, first question will be from uh, Matt Olchewski. Uh, Matt, go ahead. Um, I had asked two questions. Um, should I ask my question that wasn't much related to what you just talked about? Because you kind of answered my other question. Go for it. Um, so my question is, obviously, you have a lot more experience than a lot of us do. Um, so my question was, um, what's your best piece of advice when refing a girl's game versus a guy's game or a women's game versus men's game because I know the style of play is a lot different and the techniques that you can use while refing are, are also different depending on the game. Um, so I wanted to get your um, kind of expert opinion on that um, so that not only me can improve, improve as a referee, but other people can as well. Yeah, thanks, thanks for the question. Um, you know, we can do an entire session uh, on refing the women's game. I mean, remember, first and foremost, ultimately, it's not cricket. It's still a soccer game. Right, it's still a game. So my best advice is the, the nuances that are in a women's game are really no different than the way you think about the nuances when you do games of, say, uh, two Hispanic teams. Um, what are the nuances of refereeing, say, two Hispanic teams compared to refereeing um, a Scottish team against an English team? You know, do you referee those the same? If We've refereed um, games in, uh, in the Latino divisions or anything. Everybody knows that they cannot stand contact at the ankles. That drives them crazy. And if you don't adjust your foul selection for that, it's a long day at the office, right? Things get out of control very quickly. If, I'm, if you're refereeing games that are um, a little bit more on the, um, from, from the UK, for example, like say Scotland versus England, for some strange reason, they don't care what happens lower body. They come, they come flying in and everybody's happy. But if you touch them on their arms, they lose their minds. So again, we're going to adjust our foul selection a little bit 
based on the game in front of us. And think of the women's game as just another nuance in the way we adjust our foul selection and our management style uh, for those nuances. We do the same with the women's game. There's some physical differences. Uh, those physical differences tend to center around a lower center of gravity and a lot more strength uh, in the lower body than the upper body. So what does that mean? It means that the lower body can absorb a lot more contact. They can play through a lot more of that. And it also means um, they can inflict damage <laughs> doing that. Um, the corollary to that is that for upper body, generally they're not as strong in the upper body. So those upper body fouls drive them a little crazier because they're harder to play through. And so that's where you're going to see more lashing out. Um, tactics. Again, um, those, those differences are, are less and less as the players kind of transition from the youth uh, to the competitive youth level, I would say probably starting around 15, 16. Uh, those players are doing a lot of strength training and things, so they're able to change a point of attack uh, pretty much the same as, as the guys. So ta tactically, uh, the differences are getting smaller. You maybe see... Um, see them at the at the very young ages be a little a little different as they're developing their strength maybe um at a different pace uh than some of the guys so they may have to connect a few more passes to get the ball from one side of the field to the other maybe it's it's two passes instead of one um or for you know the long ball maybe goes to the half the halfway line but right now i'm seeing at the u14 u15 level that they can hoof the ball half a field already so i think the tactical differences are getting are getting less and less. Uh, the psychological differences um, is uh, could probably take a couple of hours, but um, those differences are also getting less and less as the socialization of girls and women is, has changed over the past few years. Generally, women run in packs, um, so an injury to someone on in my clique and in, in part of part of my team is an injury to all. Um, we have long memories. Uh, we're not in a rush to take revenge. Um, we don't want to rush into it sometimes because we may think of something better to do later. Um, but at the same time, the socialization has changed a bit. So you're also seeing the girls now have shorter fuses um, in the same way that you would normally associate in, in the guys game. So, I mean, there's kind of those three, you know, three main categories of the physical differences, any differences in the tactics, um, and the psychological differences of, of kind of the, the importance of the team. Um, but I think those, dif those differences are getting blurred more and more. And I would, I think, just approach the women's game in a way where you think of it as nuance, the same way you think of it as what are the nuances of, of, of the game I'm going to do, you know, in front of me. Um, just like it would be of, you know, uh, Europe versus Asia versus Oceania versus Caribbean football versus uh, English football. Um, and in America, you have a hodgepodge of all of those things. So it can be a little bit more challenging. But yeah, I think if I would say anything, it would be approach it as nuance and not a totally different game. Sorry, that was a really, really long answer. Amy, we just want to thank you immensely um, on behalf of the Academy, uh, NEP, and the U.S. officials. Um, this has been really, really helpful, and uh, it's a, definitely a different spin on anything else I've seen on positioning, that's for sure. So thank you immensely from all of us. Great. I also want to thank my colleagues at, at PRO, um, Alan Black, uh, who's our uh, manager of coaching and education, um, really put together uh, the, the presentation and, and source the clips and everything. And, um, you know, so we, we work as a team over there, but I do want to uh, give a shout out to, to Alan Black for um, putting the material together in, in, in a really great way. Okay. Thanks again. Now we're going to switch over to Tom Felice. Tom is going to do our little Kahoot quiz. Uh, the winner of the quiz will get uh, some swag from NEP. So this is actually for marbles. It's not just for fun, although it's a lot of fun too. So Tom, off to you. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you, Sandra, and thank you to Lee.
and NEP for setting us up for our game of Kahoot today. If you have never played Kahoot before, it's pretty easy to do. We're going to ask 10 questions, and each one will provide you with four answers. So go to kahoot.it or download the Kahoot app. You can use the QR code on your screen. So we're going to show you a question. It'll have four answers, and you have to pick the right one. So they'll be displayed here on the screen, and you'll answer on your second screen. It can be a tablet. It can be your phone. You can open up a new tab on your computer. They all work. The quicker you answer correctly, the more points you get. But if you answer incorrectly, you get nothing. And you like Spalding Smales from Caddyshack, you get nothing, and you have to like it. So if you want to be eligible for the prize, please use your real name so that we can make sure that you get the great prize from NEP. So Kahoot.it or the Kahoot app. And we'll get started with our quiz. Hello, I'm Hans Silver. This is an honor to play the winner of Major League Soccer. So go ahead and enter that pin into Kahoot. The song is the new MLS entrance theme that we only got to use for two weeks. Hopefully we'll be back on the field soon and hearing this at walkout. All right, if anybody else wants to join in, give you about 10 more seconds. Once again, kahoot.it. And the pin is 3346579. All right, we're going to get started. And once again, thank you, US officials and NEP. So, the first question a goal can be scored directly from an indirect free kick, drop ball, direct free kick, or a throw in. That is correct. A direct free kick is the only one of the four from which a goal can be directly scored. Good to see that a large percentage of people got that one right. Let's take a look at the standings. Dominic in front after the first question. On to number two. On a penalty kick, what is the sanction if there is an offense by the goalkeeper and no goal scored? Oh, the majority got it correct. Retake the penalty kick and you caution the goalkeeper. This was a law change in the past couple of years. It used to just be a retake. So we see that the 
second highest answer was just retake, but now you have to give a caution to the goalkeeper as well. New leader, new top two is Josh Mahoney and Jeffrey Ruiz. Move into the top two spots. On to the third question. What should a referee not consider before playing an advantage? The severity of the offense, how good they look signaling advantage, location on the field, or the atmosphere of the match. Here you see a picture of Mark Geiger, who is now my boss's boss's boss, so I had to make sure I got a good picture of him for this question. And that is correct. How good they look signaling advantage should not be considered. Definitely think about the severity of the offense, where on the field it happens, and the atmosphere of the match before playing advantage. Josh and Jeffrey, still our top two. Question four, the team that wins the coin toss can choose what? Which side to attack or the ball? The ball, which side to attack, or to have the referee replaced? Some days, depending on the kind of game I'm having, I'm going with D. Well, Kevin's not the only one who might go with D, but yes. Glad to see a lot of people are up on their law changes as which side to attack or the ball is now the option for the team that wins the coin to toss. And our top three stay the same. Here's question five, which is not a cautionable offense? Descent, persistent offenses, spitting, or delaying the restart? Yes, the majority have it. Spitting is not a cautionable offense. That is a sending off offense anywhere in the world. Josh stays on top now. Harris into second place and Will Ayton into third as he've hit the halfway point. When is the ball in play at a goal kick? When it leaves the penalty area, when it goes six yards, when it passes the penalty spot, or when it is kicked and clearly moves. Saw an example of this in one of the earlier clips from Sandra. That is correct. When it is kicked and clearly moves. Once again, one of the recent law changes. It used to be when it leaves the penalty area, but now when it is kicked in, clearly moves. Josh holding on to the top spot by 19 points over Will. What should not be considered when calculating stoppage time? Substitutions, injuries, when my next game starts, or time wasting? I know some of the assigners on the call will be concerned about when the next game starts, but hopefully you have enough time in between games and you're able to add the appropriate amount of time for substitution injuries, time wasting, and other events that happen during the game. No change in our top two, Ryan Block. We saw him yesterday as he pushes into the top five. When does a referee's authority begin at a match? At the kickoff, when they get the rosters, the first foul that occurs, or when the referee enters the field of play for pre-match inspection? Yep, entering the field for pre-match inspection. Great to see how many people got that one right. Question nine, two more questions. What is not something an assistant referee officially signals? When the whole ball leaves the field, 
when a coach should yell at the ref, when a player in an offside position may be penalized, or when a substitution is requested. Correct. Now the assistant referee signal might lead to a coach yelling at the ref, but that's not something that we should be trying to make. Will Ayton into the lead. And then we have our final question. In what field does Sandra Serafini hold a PhD? Is it soul snatching, brow beating, dirty looks, or neuroscience? The correct answer is neuroscience, but if you are wondering, she holds honorary degrees in the other three. And now we get a look at our top finishers. Ryan Block in third. Josh Mahoney second. And at the top of the heap, Will Ayton. Harris and Dan end up in fourth and fifth. Congratulations to our winner, Will Ayton.